Hello, friends. Good afternoon. Um, my name is David Hope Jones. I'm the Chief Executive of the Scotland Malawi Partnership, and welcome to the eighth and final in our series of webinars on Malawi Scotland uh, governance strengthening. If we were meeting in, in person at this point, I'd see a, a show of hands of who's managed to go to all eight of the, of the webinars, and there would no doubt be a, a chocolate biscuit for you, but please accept a, a virtual chocolate biscuit for our, our, our frequent flyers. Um, but what a wonderful <laughs> eight months it's been. I, I often comment that it's the fastest 60 or, or 90 minutes of the, of the whole month, such as the quality and, and caliber of the, of the speakers and presentations that we have had. Um, but of course, what, what we're hearing from today, as we have through all of the webinars, is sections of this wonderful book, Beyond Impunity, New Directions for, for Governance in Malawi. And I'm excited today that I think for the first time in, in our eight webinars, uh, we have all three of our co-editors with us today who we'll be hearing from. So really thrilled to have all of them with us. And I'm also uh, doubly thrilled that for the first time I'm able to now say the book is available wherever you are. Um, for a while, you'll remember that it's been commercially available in the UK and elsewhere through Amazon um, and through the African Books Collective um, on a print and demand basis. But as of the 13th of April, uh, this wonderful book has been available through the University of Cape Town uh, on a print and demand basis for 450 rand. Um, but excitingly as well, it's also um, freely digitally available and you can download completely free of charge the PDF of the entire book. So I'll put um, in the chat box in about five minutes time, once definitely everyone's with us, the links to where you can uh, buy it wherever you are. And most importantly, in, in Malawi, the book is now commercially available through Mizuni Press um, at a range of retailers uh, across uh, Malawi, um, in the Kacheri Bookshop in Zomba and the Society of Malawi in Blanta. And free copies are being distributed across Malawi to learning and governance institutions. And um, there will be book, uh, book launch events in all three regions of Malawi, North, Centre and South in the next few months. Details are just about to be confirmed, but we understand those events will be at Chancellor, at um, Kunima and at uh, Mizuni, um, as well as in the long way. So further details to follow in that. Uh, I'll put full details in the chat box about where you can where you can get the box, uh, the book. And um, final final comment from me is after our four uh, brilliant speakers today, and no doubt a lively Q and A on the matters of, of governance that they raise and discuss. Um, that we'll have time for a discussion around what next. So please don't uh, please don't leave the meeting before then. It's been a wonderful eight months. We've listened to, to so many brilliant, um, gifted Malawian academics, and we're really keen to have a discussion about what what does what do we do to build on this um, we've done this exercise we've um 25 leading malawian academics we've heard from we've got this fantastic book uh, and how do we really take that book off the shelves and materially change uh, uh and, and progress governance strengthening in both malawi and scotland so please as you listen to each of the speakers think of questions you can ask ask those in the chat box but crucially as well um do think about what what we should do next um, I'll come back and facilitate that final discussion, um, but with no further ado, let me hand over to our chair for uh, today, Associate Professor uh, Asiat Chueza. Asiat, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, David. A very warm welcome to all of you who have joined this webinar today. It gives me great pleasure for me to chair this final uh, webinar in a series uh, of eight webinars that we've had uh, in this series. As you are aware, we started these seminars on 27th of October in 2021, where we featured an introduction to the new book, Beyond Impunity, New Directions for Governance in Malawi. And I'm sure that many of you have been attending uh, these webinars, and you are aware that the book has 15 chapters, which were written by 25 authors and edited by Professor Ken Ross, who is around today, Wap Mulafu, who is also one of the presenters, and myself. So in short, the book takes a comprehensive critical look at Malawi's multi-party democracy and governance since 1994. So today's webinar being the eighth and the final in the series, uh, where we are exploring a chapter in greater detail, we are going to have uh, four presenters. The first presenter is going to be Dr. Paul Chiwudzabanda, who present a co-written chapter on ethnicity, regionalism, and national building challenges in post-1994 Malawi with a federal state system. 
Paul Banda is an assistant professor of history at Charleston State University in USA. The second presenter will be Professor Wapurumuka Mulafu, who will talk about rights without responsibility, governance crisis in the management of natural resources in Malawi. Professor Mulafu is the deputy vice chancellor of Nzuzu University and formerly professor of environmental history in the University of Malawi. Our third presenter is going to be Dr. Gift Wasambo Kaira, who will talk about pandemics, politics, and governance, contestations over state management of COVID-19 in Malawi, an interesting area. And then finally, we are going to have Dr. Nze Yokonia Mvula, who will talk about Malawi's governance crisis from a theological perspective, a tale of two cultures. Nze Heman Mvula is a lecturer in Old Testament Ethics and Applied Theology at the University of Malawi, while Gift Kaira is a lecturer in the History Department also at the University of Malawi. Before I hand over to the presenters, let me cover some of the essential administration points. As I am talking, please feel free to introduce yourself in a sentence in the chat box and to send a direct message to others to make useful connections. And after the speakers, we will have an open discussion, a Q&A and some reflections. And, and then we'll also talk about what next, which will actually be facilitated uh, by David. But meanwhile, please put any questions or comments in the chat room. If you're active, you can also tweet through the discussion using at Scotland Malawi and at Malawi Scotland. And it is important for us to know that this webinar is being recorded as a video and will go up online soon together with a record of the chat log and any copies of presentations that we receive. Now, let me hand over to Dr. Paul Banda. Dr. Paul Banda, you have 10 minutes and each of our presenters has 10 minutes as well. Paul, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I hope you are able to see the, the slides. Yes. Uh, that is uh, that is the title of uh, of our chapter: Ethnicity, Regionalism, and Nation Building in Post-1994 Malawi with a federal state system. It's a co-authored chapter between myself and my colleague, uh, uh, Gift Wasambo Kaira. So as a way of background and introduction, since uh, the turn of uh, the, the 21st century, there have been a lot of calls in, in Malawi uh, from <coughs> politicians and other stakeholders that Malawi must adopt uh, a federal system of government. And those people use uh, several uh, reasons, including that there is marginalization in terms of politics and in terms of uh, social economic um, uh, provisions. And uh, they argue that if we could use the existing three or four administrative regions, Southern region, Eastern region, Central region, and Northern region that if we do that, it could resolve some of those challenges in terms of the politics and social economic uh, uh, or developmental uh, provisions. So these are the things that we are discussing uh, in, the, in, in the chapter. And um, we are also, as a way of background, discussing where these things are coming from, looking at initially the, the time of uh, the Banda Hastings comes Banda government. And then after that, we're focusing on the period from 1994 to the, uh, to the present. So we are looking at what are the arguments for and arguments against uh, a federal system of government, but also we are, drawing on examples from other uh, African countries. And in the end, we're arguing that Malawi does, does not need a federal system of government 
rather Malawi needs a devolved system uh, of government. And if we do that, we are saying that Malawi could achieve what it needs in terms of nation building, but also equitable distribution of uh, uh, development uh, opportunities. So after independence, most of the, which is in the 1960s, most of the African countries were working towards the agenda of, of, of nation building. They had just come out of uh, six or seven decades of European colonial rule and they are working towards uh, nation building. For Malawi, under Dr. Hastings comes Banda, he tried, but in the paper we are saying that there were so many challenges that we have uh, uh, quoted uh, in, in, in our paper, we have cited in our paper in terms of some of the things that were done under the Banda regime. Some of them were saying that he seemed to have been favoring the, the central region and especially the Chewa people uh, of the central region, including making Chichewa as a national language, shifting the capital city from Zomba to Lilongwe, and also so many development opportunities that were given to the central region, especially Lilongwe being uh, the capital of, of, of Malawi. And we are saying that the northern region, out of the three main administrative regions, the northern region was the most neglected and people use the name the dead north. While well, for the southern region, only in the urban areas of Zomba and Blantyre, that's where we're able to detect some elements of uh, development. Remember Zomba was already uh, the capital of colonial Malawi and Blantyre was the, the business hub of, 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 of colonial Malawi. So maybe that explains why they had relatively higher levels of, of socioeconomic uh, development. And then from the 1970, late 1970s onwards, we are also talking about the social, uh, the structural adjustment programs coming in and also increasing the levels of uh, social economic challenges for, for most people in the, in the country. So what we have seen in the, in, in, in the country since the 1994 general elections is that most of, of, of the voting uh, trends because of the failure of the nation building agenda in terms of voting, you see that most of the people, in especially in terms of the presidential elections, people tend to vote for a leader from, from, from their home region or sometimes from their own uh, ethnic group. Instead of looking at the issues that those uh, presidential aspirants are raising, people usually rush to uh, to, to side with or to vote for someone from their region uh, or ethnic group. And in the 1995 constitution, those issues of nation building were saying that they were not uh, fully uh, addressed, which is why we see that uh, those regional ethno uh, biases are still continuing in, uh, in, in Malawi. So we're saying that uh, because of uh, such challenges, there have been politicians and other in, uh, stakeholders who are, who are calling for, for, for federalism and, or a federal system of government. So it could be politicians, academics, members of the clergy and other uh, pressure groups, including uh, Fafes Rudem, which is based in, in, in Mzuzu. And then there are also other people who are speaking against uh, the, the federal system of government. Again, politicians, the Public Affairs Committee, which did its own study, which shows which showed that 64% of Malawians were against uh, uh, the system. For us, in, in this chapter, as we have said, we are, we are arguing against uh, the federal system of government. We're saying that even if we, we, we do that, we, 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 we accept that it should be based on the three or four regions that we have in the country. That will still create some, some problems because in those regions, there are other 
dominant ethnic groups. For example, if you go to the northern region, you find that uh, the Tumbuka ethnic group is going to always be the dominant ethnic group, which means that, again, the other groups like the, the Lambia, the Tonga, are also going to be uh, complaining along with the, the Ngoni. If you go to the central region, you also see that it's going to be the Chewa who are going to be dominating. If you go to the south, oh, you have three minutes left. Uh, okay, so so we have used case studies from Ethiopia, Nigeria, where we are saying that even though they adopted uh, uh, the federal system of government since independence, they still have so many uh, challenges, civil wars, and other other conflicts. So. If Malawi adopts it, it doesn't mean that we are going to resolve uh, those issues. So we are proposing a devolved system of government and we have used the case study of what people in Kenya are doing. They have 47 uh, county governments. Uh, so each county is organized as follows. They have a governor who is directly elected and there's a deputy governor, there's a county executive committee, a county assembly, county staff, and the citizens. So like Malawi has 28 districts and each district will have its own governor. People are going to vote for, for that governor. And that's going to have several advantages in terms of people have a representation at, at the lower level in terms of instead of having the monopoly of the central government. So people have um, some form of direct representation at, at the level of, of the districts or the county. And then people are also going to find jobs. It's going to be the governor, but it's if it's devolved, there's going to be a health department, education department, and so on and so forth. That will be done at the local level instead of looking to the central government, which you have said that sometimes tends to focus on one particular area especially where uh, the politicians or the incumbent leaders are uh, coming from uh, at the time. So, and we are doing this paper, but recently we also just discovered that even the Afrobarometer results, uh, survey results of April 2020 also sort of agree with what we are saying in, in, in the chapter. And this is uh, their findings that from what they discovered, 66% of, of the surveyed Malawians say that they do not agree with a federal system of government. And which is why we are saying Malawi must adopt the devolved system of government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that interesting presentation. May I now invite Professor Wapu Mulafu to give us his presentation. Professor, you have 10 minutes, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, um, Chairperson, and um, welcome all participants in the webinar. Um, the title of my presentation is Rights Without Responsibility, Governance Crisis in the Management of Natural Resources in Malawi. And, the basic argument of the paper is that um, um, Malawi is going through an environmental crisis and that this crisis corresponds very well um, to the changes that have been taking place in the political arena. And that um, the crisis started uh, developing some time back, but the process itself accelerated after the attainment of multi-party system of government. Um, so at the moment, uh, for one to appreciate the crisis, you, one has just looked at the landscape in the country that um, a lot of um, forested areas have been degraded. We have constant blackouts. Uh, we have an energy crisis. And uh, most of the rivers that uh, we knew about are drying up. And uh, all these are symptoms of a deeper process that has been taking place over time. 
Now, um, from a theoretical point of view, uh, to understand the cause of the crisis, um, it's, it's very straightforward. There have been arguments that um, we're experiencing um, the neo-Mathusianist um, uh, case here that um, the population has um, grown so much that um, the resources are not able to support that population. In a way, that makes sense, but it's not the answer. It doesn't even explain the cause of the crisis in Malawi, at least. This is what I want to show that um, um, fundamentally, um, the neo Malthusianist approach does not explain the cause of the crisis. Now, um, when you look at um, the crisis itself, that um, during the um, colonial times, we had um, a, a state um, system that uh, regulated the use and management of natural resources. And laws, uh, policies were put in place that controlled how and where um, the people could use the natural resources. Not that the laws and policies were acceptable to everyone, but in some ways, the policies helped in terms of controlling um, abuse of the natural resources. And when independence was um, granted in 1964, we see that um, the first post-colonial government tried also uh, to put in place policies that um, regretted, um, sometimes in a draconian manner, the use and management of natural sources. And so that when one examines that, you see that um, a lot of the resources were protected. And um, in terms of degradation, in terms of a population, I mean, the people abusing them, that was controlled. But when um, the multi-party system of government was introduced in 1994, what we see is that um, the um, people were more or less um, told that um, you have the freedoms, you have the rights, and you need to claim your rights. And that extended sometimes also in the way in which the um, natural resources were used. A clear example would be um, those of us that are familiar uh, with um, uh, Zomba, uh, Zomba Mountain, that um, there was an influx of people, loggers going to cut down trees and um, sometimes um, corrupting the officials from the Department of Forestry. And um, so we saw a rapid deforestation of Zomba Mountain. But this is just one example of the so many other areas where the degradation started taking place. And so what I'm demonstrating here is that um, the policies indeed were there, put in place, and um, trying to encourage the management and conservation of natural resources. But underneath that was the assumption and the understanding that the newly found freedoms allowed individuals to do whatever they wanted without impunity. And that um, so we saw that individuals took the law in their own hands. And the values which had bound, which had bound society for quite some time to respect the law, to respect policies, all these were gradually being abandoned. And even though where we had the enforcement institutions to manage the natural resources, these were also heavily compromised. And we saw this also coincided with the um, neoliberal um, approach where the state had to reduce uh, funding to its institutions, in some cases downsizing, uh, the uh, staff working uh, certain departments 
Department of Forestry, Department of Game um, for National Parks. And so the reduction in the staff responsible for managing uh, the natural resources, coupled with the reduction in the funding and also the uh, newly found freedoms and rights, um, this therefore uh, contributed to the degradation of natural resources. And now, um, as we move forward, what we see is that um, we have a situation in Malawi where um, the uh, glory that we used to have in the past is gradually disappearing. And at the same time, the crisis reached its climax, especially during the administration of um, uh, Peter Mucharika, that um, when we had serious problems with the um, production of um, electricity, and um, at a time when also the, as a government decided to uh, borrow or um, get the generators from India at a huge cost. And this therefore was also testimony for the fact that uh, Malawi was experiencing uh, serious problems because that was not a long-term solution. It was very temporary and that uh, yet we spent a lot of money. Now, um, as we are speaking today, um, the situation, we've gone back to the situation that we experienced maybe some um, four or five years ago that um, we have blackouts. This was occasioned by the cyclone that we had. So my argument is that um, the investment was not properly uh, made in the um, generation of electricity uh, that could have sustained uh, production and supply over a period of time. And um, so the crisis therefore um, was compounded by the fact that um, the policies that were being implemented um, in the post-1994 period did not take into account the um, issue of impunity on the part of the citizens that they needed to um, uh, take the rights with responsibility. Because by only giving the rights to the citizens, but without emphasizing issue of responsibility, this is making the crisis even worse. And so as we're talking today, um, what is needed um, in, my, in my view, is that um, we need uh, policies, but at the same time, we also need to emphasize on the issue of responsibility so that the natural resources can be preserved and protected. Short of that, the country will continue experiencing the crisis. And unfortunately, the crisis is developing in such a manner that um, um, some of the resources are not renewable. And so we may end up having even more serious problems. So um, there's been an attempt in some cases even to involve uh, the military in the protection of natural resources. And I'm saying that um, this is helpful um, indeed for the time being, but it's not a solution, sustainable solution. So we need uh, more education uh, to the citizenry uh, so that um, they can change the values, the attitude towards natural resources. And um, if you look, as I said, um, at the previous administrations or the colonial government and the band administration, there were programs that tried um, to promote uh, some of these values. And, um, but unfortunately, these were uh, lost along the way. Uh, so in short, um, this is um, what I'm trying to advocate in the paper, that um, uh, we have a serious environmental crisis, which is resulting or uh, does correlate with the uh, political uh, challenges that the country has been going through. So thank you so much. Thank you very much.
the time. Yes. I hope I'm still yes. within the time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Mulafu. <laughs> May I now invite um, Dr. Kaira uh, to give us his presentation on pandemics, politics, and governance. Dr. Kaira, you have the floor. Thank you. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes. All right, thanks. So uh, I, I should state that this is a co-authored uh, chapter. Uh, I did it with my colleagues, uh, Bryson Coma and uh, Poju Zabanda, who just spoke on ethnicity. Um, and, and so uh, basically what, what this chapter is all about is um, um, it, it tries to focus on uh, public health interventions in Malawi, particularly uh, interventions that uh, focus on COVID-19 and the manner in which it reveals the state of governance in the country. And our major focus here was in July, uh, print and um, online media reports, uh, government reports and gazettes and so on and so forth to reconstruct the story that uh, I'm about to, to present here. And so what we do as historians, as, as historians is to locate this study within a deeper history of, of pandemics, uh, such that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic becomes the climax. So the, the background sections focus on uh, the politics surrounding pandemics such as swine flu, smallpox, HIV and AIDS, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, we argue that uh, in history, almost all the pandemics that we reflect on have attracted certain kinds of contestations. Uh, sometimes it could be uh, political leaders contesting uh, the uh, public health knowledge about how these pandemics are spread. Uh, 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 and, and I think a case in point being that of Dr. Banda, who, who used to argue that, well, Malayans cannot contract HIV and AIDS because they are morally upright. But, but the argument is that eventually such kind of contestations do have a bearing in the manner in which uh, uh, we, con we confront uh, these pandemics. So the, the starting point uh, in this chapter is uh, the uh, court injunction which the Human Rights Defenders Coalition obtained uh, against the uh, decision lockdown in, in April. 2020. That decision actually came following a series of events, and, and I do display here um, just, just to kind of refresh our memory about what happened. I know these, these issues are still fresh, but uh, I think it's, 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 it's important that uh, I should do that. So yes, 11 March 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic and called upon countries of the world to be very much aggressive to contain um, uh, this pandemic. And, and what we see in Malawi is that the then uh, uh, state president, Professor Peter Mtarika, uh, did declare a state of disaster uh, just uh, a few days later. And of course, uh, the Minister of Health came in on April 9 to gazette the Coronavirus Prevention, Containment and Management Rules under the Public Health Act of, of course, 1948 revised or amended so many times all the way to 1975. And then on 2020, I mean, on, on 15 April, that's when a uh, countrywide lockdown was, was, was announced. And that's what triggered the HRDC to come in uh, uh, to seek for the court relief. The arguments were very clear, but well, the lockdown was uh, insensitive to the plight of, of poor Malawians and many others um, who obviously live on um, uh, uh, the ritual that they obtain on a daily basis. And so henceforth, what we see here is that the country kind of moved into a, a series of, of contestations. Uh, there were so many interventions from the part of the government, uh, for example, limiting the number of pub, uh, people to gather in public events, uh, places of worship, uh, markets, and so on and so forth. Of course, there was also closure of schools and, and so many other rules that uh, perhaps many people thought that uh, they are quite insensitive to the plight of Malawians and to the interests of different groups of people. So what we see here is that um, we had different interest groups that, that uh, kind of uh, took issue with uh, 
uh, the government response towards uh, the pandemic. I, I raised here so many of them, just as examples, but there were a number of them. So street traders, all the way to uh, politicians. Uh, politicians, of course, you know, this was the time when the Constitutional Court had just declared the 2019 general elections unlawful. And so it was a time where politicians and political parties were very busy campaigning, right? And, and for them to be told that, well, you should limit the number of people in, 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 in your uh, political alleys, they, they just thought that, well, the government really wanted to uh, disallow them to campaign so that the government should have a leverage over them. Uh, of course, public health workers too had their own concerns. I'll highlight uh, some of them as we go uh, along. So the key question we raise in this chapter is what do these contestations over COVID-19 reveal about the Malawian state and matters of governance? That's the question that I want us to keep at the back of our minds. Okay, so now, now, here what we do is we project uh, three explanations. Well, the first one argues that uh, the contestations, uh, what they do is to, to expose, right? The frustrations that citizens usually have uh, against uh, uh, the state for having done very little to uh, 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 deep-seated historical problems. In other words, uh, our argument here is that we shouldn't just look at uh, the events that unfolded between February and July 2020 as uh, things that uh, were just connected to the pandemic, but then they do have a very long historical background that uh, Malawians had been facing so many challenges for a long time, and that uh, pandemic kind of just uh, set a trigger uh, to most of the uh, uh, challenges that they had, forcing them to act uh, in the manner they did, and of course to oppose the government and the state in the manner uh, they did. Uh, we, we give some few examples here, like uh, the concerns that uh, public health workers had. By public health workers here, we're referring to nurses, doctors, and the others who were very much busy to make sure that we arrest this uh, pandemic. So now, now, if you look here in terms of statistics, they noted that uh, the country only had about 509 healthcare centers, right, across the country, uh, and, and that these were quite inadequate. Uh, by the way, out of these, it's only about four uh, 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 centers that, that do qualify as hospitals with the name, because they are referral hospitals and equipped with, of course, uh, uh, intensive care unit beds. And so they also noted that uh, most, almost all these hospitals um, do have challenges to do with funding, drug shortages. They don't, they don't even have adequate transportation. Of course, at that time, they didn't even have the adequate uh, personal protective equipment. And then there were also some uh, uh, personal, personal uh, fears here that uh, uh, for a long time, even though the government was putting the wealth workers in the forefront, but look at the risk allowances that these people were receiving. At that time, the minimum was 1,000 kwacha per month, which was just about 1.3 US dollars, and the highest was 2.4. Uh, this was definitely a more curry to um, um, our men uh, uh, in, the, in the white uniform. And, and uh, uh, only 25 intensive care unit beds uh, against a population of about 18 million people was again a more curry. And they, so they thought that, well, uh, hospitals were nothing other than a health uh, 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 death traps, rather. And, and so they, they too went to the streets, as we saw, uh, protesting that the government needs to do something. Otherwise, um, uh, this is not going to work. Uh, there would not be in a position to uh, effectively fight against this uh, pandemic. Number two, uh, uh, we, we argue that what these contestations do, again, is to uh, complicate notions of an on, of a bearing or an autonomous state that can really nearly uh, make decisions or project its power on the citizenry. That, that gone are the days when states could do almost anything uh, with real respect to the challenges that the common folk are facing on the ground. Uh, that Dr. Kaira, you should be winding up. You have three minutes left. Wow, that was quick. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, and, and, and that um, um, we, we argue here that uh, uh, we cannot cling to notions of a Liberian, Liberian state, a state that is all powerful, as uh, 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 reckoned by a Congolese phrase uh, or proverb, Bura Matari, a stone crusher, that citizens do have the power. Even the people that do not have a voice, they do have the power to express their frustration. So when you saw them joining, for example, HRDC organized demonstrations, we should reflect 
uh, on that as a response of uh, the local people trying to question uh, the state for its decisions that um, did not necessarily take into consideration uh, their concerns. Uh, number three, the contest contestations, we argue, also reveal the state's failure to cultivate and tap on public opinion, right? Here we, 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 we tap on uh, uh, Habermas' uh, conceptualization of the public opinion, and of course, the manner in which that public opinion plays uh, in public sphere. Uh, public opinion here is, uh, uh, I mean, he defines it as a particular social and communicative space where individuals that are excluded from the exercise of state power are able to uh, publicly express and critique the state. I mean, uh, they're able to tell the state what it should do and what it should not do. So in most countries, we noticed that in where lockdowns were implemented, there was a very strong public opinion in favor of lockdowns, but not so uh, in Malawi. Um, perhaps because there was very little state support uh, before the lockdown was, was announced, uh, perhaps in, um, uh, they felt like society would just be shaving human rights matters for nothing, right? Very weak European country. People of one failure to consult all the concerned parties. I think there was very little consultations. Even the presidential task force that uh, were responsible for managing the pandemic uh, were elitist in nature. They did not necessarily include the local people on the ground or even the representatives. And we also noticed that uh, we also had so many contradictions within the society itself. Different groups of people expressing different opinions, sometimes contradicting each other. So if students wanted to be in school, some parents and guardians wanted, him to, wanted them to be home for their safety, right? Public health officials wanted people at least to be uh, uh, off towns so that the hospitals could cope. But private school owners really wanted to, to have students in school so that at least they should earn money uh, to pay teachers and of course and others, right? Professionals would easily accept lockdowns because they have access to internet, they can work from home, they have refrigerators to keep some food, but not so with street traders and workers, all right? Politicians too had their own interests. So what we're saying here is that um, uh, so many voices speaking different languages uh, created what we call a paralysis that uh, uh, made the government not make much uh, uh, progress. So this is how I conclude, I'll read this. So while highlighting the interaction between the state and other stakeholders in the face of COVID-19 pandemic, we also pay attention to the very composition of the stakeholders in question, pointing out the diverse views they expressed, which were at best irreconcilable. We argue that to contain a pandemic in such a country, we, uh, a state must be dynamic and sophisticated, listening and assertive at the same time. However, as legitimate as holding the government accountable is, Compliance was complicated by the politics of the time, as well as prevailing divergent opinions and stakeholders' interests. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kaira, for that interesting presentation. Our last presenter um, today is supposed to be Dr. Nzei Mvula. Dr. Mvula, are you around? Our presentation chapter here, Malawi Governors in Crisis, Malawi governor's crisis in theological perspective, a tale of two cultures was authored by uh, Prof. Ken and myself. Uh, the chapter basically discusses Malawi's governor's crisis from a theological perspective, and it deals with the question of Malawi's political culture, among others, arguing that Malawi's governance does not only depend on legal systems, but also greater influenced and dependent on the prevailing political culture and that the theology being concerned with the deep roots of culture is so vital if governance systems are to be transformed in Malawi. Mm. The question being addressed in this chapter therefore is whether the 80% of confessional Christians faith dimension of Malawian life can yield resources that are relevant to the renewal of Malawian political culture. In other words, we are, are there theological perspectives that can add value to Malawi's quest for good governance? The observation of the authors in this chapter is that the importance of this question lies in the fact that Malawi's failures in governance are derived more from a forte political culture than from any shortcomings in the constitutional or political structures of, of this nation. 
It is in this way, it is in the way that the people think, their motivations and ambitions that are in need of transformation. Here, therefore, religious and theological considerations can be both formative and informative. This chapter discusses three main points of engagement with the current context. And these are actually the issues that we are trying to, to find solutions to. Uh, the first is corruption and plunder, where these show prevailing political culture, where every social stratum of Malawi society has been riddled with corrupt practices, both in the corridors of power, as well as in the lower circles of civil and public services. Number two, impunity and accountability. The underlying issue here is the entitlement culture of the ruling elite that allows them to imagine that they can take the people for granted fooling them into allowing themselves to be exploited for the benefit of the powerful few. This, or oh, they do this with confidence that they will never be called to account. Hence, they have unlimited abuse of power. And that becomes an impunity kind of aspect in that. Third is the leadership itself. In Malawi, experience has shown that Malawians are to a great extent led down by the national leadership. Uh, for example, in a number of writings, various uh, pastoral writers have raised the issue of poor and indecisive national leadership. Uh, characteristically then, therefore, these letters uh, state that Malawians need honest, democratic, transformational leadership, visionary, uh, selfless, servant leadership, good stewards, leaders that actually are very democratic and actually respect the constitution and the rule of law and they are willing to step up to step down and even being above reproach above tribal or regional and political interests people who are also accountable to both the electorate as well as uh to god so Malawi needs such kind of leadership. And that's the argument that the, the, the chapter is putting across. Therefore, in order to address these challenges, the chapter proposes a threefold approach that demonstrates how theological perspectives can be brought to bear. One is the biblical text uh, in which we are saying the Bible, which is our focus in this paper, uh, the Bible actually, uh, has issues that have to do with the good governance. And we're saying that the Bible shows that uh, governance is a divine mandate for leaders to actually serve the people, not to serve their own interests. Uh, the second uh, issue in that is the global theological thinking, that it's not only the Bible that can inform such kind of uh, solutions to this, but also global theological thinking, whereby uh, international conferences, for example, there was a conference in, a, in Arusha in 2018, where the World Council of Churches actually called on the church to be what it ought to be, the light and the sword, to shine and help governments to administer social justice for national developments to be uh, actualized in, in, in the nations. Number three, of course, another resource, which is our last resource there, is the local, theolog local contextual theology, where we are arguing that Malawi has had already demonstrated this kind of, of, of approach, where uh, various scholars, theological scholars in Malawi have taken into task to look at, to help the government in a number of ways. For example, we, we look at even before the Matpata dispensation, where uh, uh, one scholar, uh, the late Kalilombe, also in his uh, writing where he argues for see, judge, and act methodology in doing things whereby he's urging the church and the Christian communities to, to assess by seeing and judging and then acting on the issues that the government does so that things should actually be uh, channeled toward the direction of good governance. And another uh, scholar in Malawi, is the late Musopolo who just passed on a few weeks ago uh, with his Umuntu theology and ethics. Uh, Musopole actually argues for, for good governance based on 
umuntu ethics where as as governors uh, the government has to do things based on how it looks at uh, who they are and who the people they are serving are apart from that we also have actually one of the scholars around uh, and this is Kirk Jere, who is arguing actually on trying to look at the Czech's continued vigilante uh, approach to governance issues, where he's actually saying the Czechs, through issuing of their pastoral letters, through the pulpit, actually could help the electorate to be vigilant in terms of uh, championing the destiny of their government when it comes to uh, helping the government to become so responsible and accountable to the electorate. In conclusion, then, as a as a way of trying to marry the, the things together, the 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 subtitle of our of our book chapter says a tale of two cultures. So we are saying political culture and theological culture intersect at every turn in Malawi. Therefore, there is need to intensify the application of theological perspectives to to the political realm. This means that religious values can be deployed so as to have a critical and constructive role in the social and political reforms and renewal of Malawi's political culture. So our argument has been in this chapter to point out a threefold uh, theological resource to help address some pressing contemporary governance challenges. As Malawi seeks new directions in, uh, in regard to such matters as corruption, impunity, and leadership, among the resources at its disposal, our theological perspectives. In the Malawian context, these may have deeper reach than anything found at mere structural political level. The roots of culture lie down and, and it is uh, this so much profound level that uh, theology must do its work. Here too, governance must find its foundation and it and it will be missing an important opportunity if it fails to call theology into service. And even as a matter of fact, after 30 years of uh, uh, despotic rule of MCP's H uh, Kamuzbanda's regime, it was theological discourse that brought in this kind of change that we are enjoying today of my party dispensation. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nze, and thank you for turning up, and thank you very much for keeping the time. All right, thank you. I, I guess we can um, move on. So what we'll do now is uh, to open um, the discussion. On the basis of the presentations that have been made by the uh, three speakers, uh, we are going to have a question and answer session, but also some reflections. So I noticed that there are some questions that have already been put in the chat box, but you can also do so now if you have any questions to the three presenters. Currently, I see a few questions um, directed towards the uh, poll um, band. I think there was um, a, a question that was raised about the financial costs. Do you have a sense of the comparative financial costs of the status quo? versus federalism and then uh, devolution. Paul, would you like to take um, this question up? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Yes, um, we always say that democracy is always going to be uh, expensive, where you choose people to, uh, to, to vote and take uh, uh, offices like that. It's always going to be expensive because for example, the Kenya model that we're using, mm. they have 47 county governments. So there has to be a county governor and a deputy county governor. The governor needs a Mercedes Benz and a, a four by four Toyota Land Cruiser, things like that. But you cannot run away from the expense. In, mm. in, and by doing that, you are also marginalizing a lot of people. So we have to accept that sometimes it's going to be expensive, but we have to, we have to pay for it in terms of achieving uh, the, the, the goals that we need uh, uh, for Malawi. Mm -hmm. Because now we have district commissioners, those are uh, basically civil servants. Uh, they are reporting directly to the aligned ministry, the minister of, 
of, of, of local governments. But with a devolved system, we will need to have uh, county governors or county governments. So that would be expensive, but we cannot run away from the expenses. Right now we have uh, 193 members of parliament and they are even talking about increasing the number again. So anywhere you, you look, anywhere you go in a democratic system, you cannot run away from, from paying for it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thank you very much. There is another question in the chat box for Dr. Kaira uh, and, and team. What is the country's doctor population ratio in Malawi? Also in Kenya, the pandemic came at the heels of endless poor relations between the government, the biggest employer of doctors and nurses as a result of long contested remuneration and poor provision of healthcare equipment by government. In this regard, what were or are the levels of motivation of healthcare providers in Malawi? Dr. Kaira. Yes, uh, thank, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Gituku. And you are right. I, I think the, the two countries do compare very well. And um, uh, I, I think that was uh, the, the whole idea that uh, um, the, the, the ratio of 28 nurses for uh, 100,000 patients or two physicians for 100,000 uh, patients, it, it was alarming and, and it still remains alarming even today. And, and so um, the healthcare workers were quite worried that, you know, these are the challenges that the state has failed to resolve for ages. And now, boom, here the pandemic, what do we do? I mean, there is no way we can just uh, uh, take care of all the people who became to the hospitals. It's not just possible. So even when they were demonstrating, they went into the streets. It wasn't just the question of, of, of poor allowances or, or, or the, the, the low allowances, but it was also the question of uh, the fact that they were already overwhelmed with uh, the existing number of patients. And it, it was just uh, difficult for them to imagine how they would cope with uh, the many people who became to the hospitals uh, because of uh, the pandemic. So, yes, I would say that uh, the two countries do compare very well on that count. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I noticed that there are no further questions uh, in, in the chat. I would like, I think at this moment, uh, to thank all the presenters that have uh, presented their chapters in these webinars. Uh, they have demonstrated um, clarity in terms of the issues that they were examining. And we thank you for your insights and also individual perspectives. I would like to also take this opportunity to thank my coordinators, my co-editors, Ken Ross and Wapu Mulafu, and all the authors for their contributions and ensuring that the book project sees the light of the day. Thank you, Scotland Malawi Partnership, for your mutual support in hosting these webinars, and especially David Jones and Craig for your diligence in ensuring that this whole series is a success, both in Scotland and in Malawi. This indeed has been a very engaging and productive uh, series. I would like to wish you all the very best. God bless you and God bless Malawi. Let me hand over to David Jones, who is the Chief Executive of the Scotland Malawi Partnership. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Chueza. And please, please don't uh, go, we're not, we're not finishing. Uh, just yet, friends, we do have uh, time left um, for uh, an open discussion, as promised, on, on what next. And I wonder if it might be helpful, first off, um, to give perhaps two or three minutes worth of, of context, including historical context for me, of, of where this work has come from and perhaps where it sits in the, in the bilateral relationship from my perspective. And I would love, if I may, at the end of that, to hand over to Professor Kenneth Ross, who's been uh, key, uh, closely involved in this project, um, but but also with the with the bilateral relationship more generally, and then and then to uh, colleagues in mass. I know Stella and Linda are here, um, so please do jump in at that point. This has actually been a co-hosted endeavour, and then uh, open it up to everyone to to think about what um, what we want to do next in this space. 
So by, by way of historical context, if I may, um, back in uh, November 2005, then President Bingua Mataraka, then First Minister Jack McConnell and their respective cabinets met in uh, uh, the, the newly uh, reinstalled Scottish um, Parliament in, in Edinburgh. Um, and a cooperation agreement was written at that time. It had four strands and the first strand was uh, governance cooperation. And so sort of first strand bullet point one has been governance uh, from day one of the much re-energized intergovernmental uh, relationship. But I think um, the Scottish government would be the first to admit that over the intervening years, there has been less activity as a part of the governmental program in the governance space for probably a, a few different reasons, not least of which there's been open calls for applications and generally um, the sort of NGOs and organizations that are applying for grants tended to choose for interventions in more traditional ground of healthcare or education or even business as opposed to governance. So it, it, it slightly sat idle for quite a number of, of years. And we in the Scotland Malawi partnership have always thought that was a, a, real, a real shame because we think this is a very fertile space for cooperation between our two small nations, not least uh, because of the nature of our friendship, um, the fact that our uh, relationship is, 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 is a dignified partnership, a two-way partnership in which reciprocity is key. Um, as uh, Alistair has just put in the chat box, many of the themes that have come out today directly resonate to, to Scotland's experience. Uh, and from the outset, we've always talked about a, a warts and all uh, cooperation in governance, recognising uh, Scotland's great many failings in this space and the many parallels and the many uh, successes and failures in both our countries and, and a shared desire to learn from one another. We were very pleased then in 2018 when uh, the new updated intergovernmental cooperation agreement included governance uh, again. Um, but if we're honest, since then again, there hasn't been a huge amount. Um, Professor Ken Ross, uh, while in, in, in Scotland, was for much of our life as an organisation, our, our chair, as, as many of you uh, will will know. And Ken and I had many uh, long discussions about, about what, what governance cooperation could usefully look like between our two countries, about how do we avoid the sort of slightly patronising and patriarchal tone that too often, I think, has defined governance cooperation between the global north and the global south, that sort of implicit tone of, of uh, the global north uh, helping the global south, when in reality, uh, their governance challenges remain in the north as much as in the south, arguably. Um, so we, uh, various uh, ideas were started, but we never could 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 reach a, a momentum. And, and, and credit to our three co-authors, of which uh, Ken is 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 one. Um, they entirely off their own back put together this wonderful book, this wonderful initiative. Uh, Wapu Asiat and and, and Ken. Um, and it's absolutely their success and, and nothing to do with the SNP uh, at all. Really, we were involved as a national network quite late in the process. Um, and, and really, we were delighted to sponsor this brilliant book, really to make it physically available to as many as, as possible, but also digitally available. And this is where it comes into the COVID pandemic, um, the, the why we've done these, these webinars. And they've been wonderfully in inclusive. Um, and thanks to everyone that's been involved. But, but, but here's to the question of what next. We've got this wonderfully strong foundation of, of a, of, of a, of a Malawi-led, uh, Malawi-focused initiative on governance that's had some modest support from Scotland. We've had uh, really good discussions with, with, with many good Scottish speakers as well for many of these, of these sessions. And I'm keen to ask that question. With governance uh, writ large in our intergovernmental uh, bilateral relationship and integral, I think, to the civic bilateral relationship. How do we build on that strong foundation? How do we effect demonstrable change and progress against some of these issues that have been identified that exist in both Malawi uh, and, and, and Scotland? How do we move from the theoretical and perhaps the backward looking to the, to the forward looking, to the active and the activist? And that's the space I'm really keen to listen to views. And with that, I don't know, Ken, if you're there, if you are happy to share some some thoughts and reflections, and then it'd be wonderful to hear from Masp. Ken, are you are you there? Yes, I, I am here. David, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Ah, great. Uh, yeah, no, thank you so much. And um, let me just take the chance when I when I have the floor to to thank all colleagues who've, who've been involved in in the book, the editors, 
uh, the authors and the participants in the webinar. For us, it's it's really been fantastic that we're not having to wait a, a year or two for a book review, but uh, it's been a kind of living book review as, as people have been uh, discussing and, re and responding. Uh, but just to be uh, brief about next uh, steps, I, I, I think if I could, could just kick off with, with a couple of points. I, I do think um, for uh, Malawi, the, there's a very important role for uh, academic analysis of, of governance, of political uh, trends. And to me, the, the distinctive offering of, of this book is, is that it's, it's a multidisciplinary or, or cross-disciplinary uh, contribution. So if you've been following the webinars, you, you've been listening to uh, to lawyers, theologians, historians, economists, political scientists, cultural uh, analysts. And uh, to me, uh, we, we, we've been able to offer much more that, than any one discipline could have done uh, by itself. Uh, and I hope this is something as the, as the book gets into circulation in, in Malawi, that will be uh, not only a contribution to the academic community, but also to public life in, in Malawi. And that is part of the responsibility of the academy. So for me, a hope would be that we, we find ways to look at uh, how we might uh, continue and <coughs> develop uh, this kind of uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration that, that can shine a light on the uh, political life of, of the country and in the end, hopefully make a contribution to, to strengthening it. Um, Chancellor College, of course, has, has a strong track record in this area. And it's perhaps not surprising that when you look at the contributors to the book, you, you find very many of them in one way or another are uh, connected with uh, Chancellor College. Um, however, we're all very aware today that the, the time when Malawi had only one university is, is long behind us. And uh, perhaps one thing that we should be looking at if there is this kind of academic uh, endeavor uh, is whether it, it, it could spread more broadly, drawing in uh, scholars from uh, other universities, other institutions that might be uh, active in this area. Uh, so that uh, across the, the nation, uh, we, we could work together and, and perhaps offer something even uh, stronger in the future. When turning to the Scottish dimension, I, I do think the, the, the question of, of mutuality is, is very important. And of course, there can be interaction with, with many different contexts, but these, these two small countries at, at uh, an opposite hemispheres, uh, Scotland and Malawi, we've, we've learned so much from each other through a century and, and a half. Um, there's a lot to build on. And so perhaps we, we have a certain competitive advantage in looking to work together and, and underline what people have been saying in, in the chat that there's sometimes been, I think, a, an idea that, uh, that you know, the art of democratic government has, has been perfected in a country like the UK. And it's, it's only in, in, in Malawi that there are, there are struggles to achieve good governance. But this very day, as, as we've been uh, meeting, there's been a an report of an independent inquiry has been published in, in the UK that has found that there was a culture of, of law-breaking and drunkenness right at the heart of, of government, uh, the very time when the government was responsible to lead the country through the COVID uh, pandemic. So I, I certainly hope the days are past when anyone would be imagining the, the success is only on one side and, and the problems are, are, are only on, on the other. It's it's always, I think, going to be a challenge in, in every country and uh, much that we can do by, by learning uh, from each other. So I don't know where it would go from here. Maybe I know for Scotland, Malawi, there's more dimensions than the academic and, and maybe some more 
uh, applied work, maybe some involvement of some key uh, practitioners might, might be involved in the next phase. But uh, with that, let me pass the, the baton on to, to Masp and hear, hear the thoughts from your side. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, and, and I'm not sure whether Linda or Stella, I, we're slightly putting you on the spot, so I do apologise. But if a MASP representative was happy to speak, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, David. I'm here, I'll speak. Um, I'm not on my workstation, but I uh, um, let me take this opportunity to... Uh, to thank all the, uh, the presenters. Uh, indeed, it has been a fantastic journey all the way. Listening to, the, uh, to all the presenters, uh, to me, um, it's, it's indeed uh, a book that has outlined most of the issues that if we address them here in Malawi, Malawi should be able to move more steps ahead. Um, <clears throat> This book, uh, quoting uh, Ken, indeed, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, academic analysis. To me, of course, it's academic analysis, but I, listening to the presenters, uh, this, um, the, the book or the, the, the webinars has uh, indeed enlightened us on some of the issues. As such, we should be able to come up with uh, actionable um, activities that if we implement on the ground, it could be advoc advocacy work, it could be a serious engagement with the government or in the civil society to ensure that uh, we address most of the challenges that the, that the book has addressed. I will also emphasize again to say, uh, there's a lot of emphasis and uh, the issues that have, that have been raised in the book if we address them, uh, we should be able to move uh, more steps ahead. You may not, you may, you may agree with me that uh, corruption and uh, probably um, like uh, one of the presenters today talk, talked about uh, mismanagement in terms of uh, mismanagement of natural resources. That is uh, a huge thing here in Malawi. Corruption is very huge and maybe uh, the way we procure things, we spend a lot of resources uh, that are meant to, um, to, uh, to uplift the lives of uh, many people who are vulnerable, who are suffering, who are in dire poverty. So to me, I would propose that uh, maybe as a follow-up, we uh, maybe together on the Malawi team, uh, my, my, my colleagues from Chasa College, Maybe we sit down together and isolate what we may call recommendations and also come up with uh, maybe related strategies on how we, we can move steps ahead. Uh, at that point, let me once again uh, recommend or thank all the, the, the writers as well as uh, David for taking an interest on this issue that is very uh, important for Malawi. And also for, I should make mention, I had forgotten to mention this, when David uh, mentioned that uh, we want to, to have a series of webinars on governors, I get at a bit because I was not sure whether uh, we'll be safe or not, but here we are. This is a demonstration that um, the government is, uh, is open or the government is uh, tolerating. Because if it was a different setup, we probably maybe would have stopped. We would have people following us or maybe uh, threats, but here we are. So thank you so much, uh, the, the writers. Thank you so much, Ken Ross, um, all the colleagues from Chasa College and the participants and all the people who have been coming to attend to, to this function. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Stella. Um, and thank you, Ken, as, as well. So I think some, some great reflections and some great ideas there. Um, 
I think Stella's idea, particularly of a, a Malawi led process of with the authors of, of, of the book, but also civic activists in Malawi to to, to still out from from these uh, 400 excellent uh, peer reviewed pages as, as succinct uh, recommendations as possible, um, not necessarily um, branded by the authors of the book. We don't look to um, impede obviously the, the academic in, independence of that but if we were able to pull out some of the, the key uh, recommendations from from the book um, and then perhaps structure a few more engagements into into those space so uh, gently guiding from the the sort of uh, academic and I don't mean that at all in a, in a, in a negative sense uh, to the the sort of practical uh, and from more the backward looking to the to the to the forward looking with a, a succinct number of recommendations, perhaps some uh, uh, events in, in practical areas like good governance in NGOs or in government and parliament, in, in faith groups, in, in business. Yeah. I think that's an excellent I idea and I'd be very keen to listen to reflections on that. I'll, I'll turn to Eve, Eve Broadis um, and I know Eve's put a comment there about faith groups. I don't know Eve whether you want to vocalise your, your comment there um, but also beyond that please do put your ideas, your reflection, your reflections on that idea of distilling out key recommendations and having a shorter number of very focused, forward-looking, practically minded events. Do put your comments to that in the chat box or put up your hand if you'd like to speak. But Eve, if you'd like to voice your point, over to you. Yeah, yeah, I just, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm really disappointed with the church. Um, just, I mean, there are so many people. I mean, yeah, okay, I'm not a church girl anymore because, but, you know, I have a faith. Um, because every time I go into church and start talking about fair trade, it's sort of, I don't know, somehow it doesn't resonate. But, you know, the way to actually help people out of poverty in countries like Malawi is to actually understand history, you know, the cultural history, um, missionaries going out, etc., etc. I don't want to get into all of that. But, you know, now we have really good products coming out of Malawi and there is such an opportunity for the, you know, church dollars, if you like, to actually do more to actually buy you know i suppose i'm using the, the, the coffee david if i'm honest about it you know if every church goer in scotland bought a coffee or a value-added product it's going to make so much impact on the ground i don't know why we haven't got something you know through the churches i mean i'm a church of scotland member um and i gave up many years ago trying to sort of do something so I suppose that's what I'm saying, you know, to be sustainable. I've been in, a, in the World Federal Trade Organization for over 30 years. We know what sustainable is. You know, we know that it's on the ground. People need, if, they're, if they've got a product, you buy it, it gives them income. And, you know, this word sustainable is now being banded around. I'm still not sure people actually understand what it means to be sustainable, you know. And I think Malawi really does need so much more support in sustainable trade. But, you know, you know, you know my thoughts on that. And I just think the church could do so much more. Absolutely. Really Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Eve. I mean, please feel free. Uh, so Eve's points there about the key role of uh, faith based groups in, in both countries and the role of trade, specifically fair yeah. trade. Obviously, the, the church in Malawi has had a really pivotal role in, in governance strengthening, whether it be from the, 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 the Catholic bishop, bishop's letter uh, 30 years ago to the to the role of the PAC. Um, through recent times please feel free if there's uh, any representatives of any faith groups who want to come back on that point they're they're most uh, welcome to or indeed any anyone else that would like to make any different points to that as a proposed way forwards no problem at all any other comments or input the proposal at the moment is that there is a malawi-led process to draw out key recommendations from the book uh, not necessarily looking to speak for the authors um, but then uh, perhaps later in 2022, uh, a series of, again, co-hosted events looking at key themes, um, looking at those recommendations, um, perhaps on a more applied and less academic basis. Um, jump in if you would like to make a comment or put it in the chat box or put up your hand. Otherwise, I will begin to draw the meeting to a close with uh, uh, with an eye on the clock. Uh, as ha others have already, there's always a lot of a lot of thank yous at the end of at the end of a series like this, especially when it's been so successful. But I really do want to put on record my thanks to the excellent 
uh, three co-editors of the, 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 the book, um, uh, Professor Kenneth Ross, Professor uh, Asiat Chueza and uh, Professor uh, Wapu Mulwafu, um, to all 25 of, of the authors, including uh, our four excellent speakers today. Craig, if you're happy to put on the screen the, the poll for, for today's meeting, and if you're happy to, to make a couple of clicks to give your votes, that's always really appreciated. Um, the full video from today will be available, as all eight are, on uh, the single web page that'll be moved from the sort of upcoming events page to the past events page on the Scotland Malawi Partnership website. We'll also put on there the full link to where you can get that book. A reminder, you can get it completely free immediately as a PDF version. So if you're just looking to read the thing quickly, um, that's the way to do it. You can get it completely free or you can purchase it in Malawi, in South Africa or anywhere in the world through the Africa Books Collective and Amazon. It's been a real pleasure to go on this journey with you over the last eight months, to listen to many friends and many experts in Malawi about governance strengthening. We as two countries, as two friends, uh, are on this journey together. As, as Ken said very eloquently, uh, anyone watching the House of Commons uh, in, in the UK will realise we're a very long way from reaching our, our final destination and we have at least as much to learn as we do to offer. Um, but I look forward to uh, joining you, I hope, in the next chapter of that journey. And please don't be shy. Drop myself an email or drop my colleagues in, in, in MASP uh, a, a, an email if you have any ideas about what how we should use the friendship between Malawi and Scotland to strengthen governance. But in the meantime, wish you all the very best from Scotland. And my thanks to you for joining us through these webinars. And my thanks to all the authors. Zikomo Kwambiri. Goodbye.